recording. All right. So I think we are recording, but let me double check and make sure it's recording from the right microphone. Because sometimes it defaults to, oh yeah, it defaults to the, it is connected. Why is it not recognizing this? Okay, let me give it one more try. Somehow my UFO thingy is not working. Hmm. Okay, we'll give, we'll give it another try. Turn it off. So we're good. All right. So we are recording. Let me move my mouse here. I think we're all done with um, binary subtraction and comparison. So, you know, we are moving on to a new topic unless there are questions about binary subtraction. So do we have any questions about binary subtraction? Let me see if I can find that slide. Um, all right. So and back to here. So binary subtraction is, th is this particular module. So the question I have is, do we have any questions about this module? I'm not seeing any hands. Yep, um, go ahead. Well, we were only working on subtraction. Uh -huh. Does this work for addition? Well, there, you cannot use addition for comparison. So addition does not apply in this context. So when we want to compare, the only reason why we want to compare or we want to know whether x is less than y is because that is the most basic decision-making mechanism when you're writing a program. Okay, so when you write a C program or C++ program, what is the most basic way to make a decision? Should I continue with a loop or another iteration or should I exit the loop? A lot of times it is, okay, is the indexing variable less than or not less than a certain number, right? So that's why we need to understand how to compare and see if one value is less than another value. So that's the motivation of this particular module, which talks about you know, comparison. And the mechanism for comparing is subtraction, which we also have talked about in binary subtraction. So that's why everything is related, because we started off with um, number representation and base conversion, where we say, okay, um, this is a quantity. How do we represent this quantity as a base two number? Base two, because you know, everything inside the computer are binary, okay? Either you have a voltage beyond a certain threshold, or you have a voltage that is below a certain threshold. That's how you know, digital computers or binary digital computers work. So that's why everything needs to be zero and one, and base two becomes important. And we first learn how to represent values in base two, and then we you know, try to say, okay, but if everything is in base two, can we still perform addition and subtraction using logic gates? That, so that's when we talk about binary addition and subtraction. And we found ways to do it, okay, using only uh, the conjunction, disjunction, and logical negation operators. And then you know, in the first week, we already talked about how all, all of those can be done by NAND, because NAND itself is also using only four transistors. So now we know how inside a computer we can perform binary addition and subtraction. But then we look at this and go like, okay, in the regular program, we need to compare values. Is this value less than the other value? So that's why we talked about binary comparison. Um, and then we also, obviously in between, we talked about signed versus unsigned representation because not every value that we want to represent are non-negative. Very you know, often we have to represent negative values as well. So, you know, so all of those are interconnected. So that means you know, if you're taking notes, sometimes it helps to put all the concepts on the piece of paper and then draw lines across you know, the things that are connected. And you will find that 
instead of having a tree or a linear um, thing, you know, which looks nice, we have a mesh. It is a mess, okay? Because you know, a lot of things you know, point in different directions and every a few things point to one single thing and so on and so forth. So you should look at a mesh, M-E-S-H, when you look at the dependency of all the concepts that we have talked about so far. And it's helpful to have that mesh, okay? You have to kind of write that out and draw it yourself so that you can visualize you know, how everything you know, relates to each other. So does that kind of help answer your question? Okay, I know it's a kind of expanded you know, more than what you originally asked. So we are now you know, going into floating point number representation. And the whole concept of this particular module, which is here, is to talk about how do we represent a value such as 1.75 or you know, 16 or 17.875, okay? So let's take a look at that first, okay? Um, and this is also a module that takes a little bit of math, okay? So you know, we are gonna review some of the math concepts that are actually important to us. So I'm not sure whether I want to do it with um, just a text editor or do we want to use a uh, Joplin for this. You know, it kind of depends on you know, what kind of math we're going to go through. So I'm going to use a regular text editor to begin with. And if we need to, we can you know, basically go to Joplin. All right. So here's a blank one. There we go. All right. So the first idea is how do we represent a value like, okay, I'm going to pick one that is a little bit harder to represent, uh, say 21.875. Uh, let's make it 625. There we go. This is a base 10 number, 21.625. And the question is, what does it look like as a base 2 number? Okay. So what do you think? What, what is the technique that we have been using to convert a value into the base 2 representation? I think, it, yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, so we want to work with powers of two. So you're correct, absolutely correct. We want to work with powers of two, which means mm, it might be helpful to look at all the powers of two that seems to be related to this one, okay? So people would go like, okay, maybe 32 as a power of two can be helpful. Okay, we'll, we'll start with that. And then 16 is the next one down. And then we have 8, which is the next one down, okay? So 2 to the power of 3. We have 4, which is yet another one. 2, I mean, you guys get the idea. And then we have 1, which is 2 to the power of 0. And then we have, guess what? 0.5, okay? Because we're looking at the negative exponent of 2. So this is 2 to the power of negative 1. And then 0.25, which is a quarter is 2 to the power of negative 2, and then point 0.125 is 2 to the power of negative 3. Okay, so I'm going to pause here, okay, just to make sure that we are comfortable with raising 2 to a power that is negative. Are we comfortable with that? Okay, yes? Well, we are getting there. We're trying to get to the floating point representation, but we before we get there, we have to look at um, a floating, uh, not a floating point, but a binary number that has decimal places. Basically. Obviously, we do not call them decimal places anymore. You know, to be more correct, you know, we should look at those as quote unquote binary you know, places because we're not actually using decimal anymore. All right, so these are the powers of two that you and handy for this particular example. So our job is to look at this and go like, okay, how can we express 21.625 using a sum of some of these uh, powers of two and to use the least number of these as possible? Because one way to go about doing this is simply to say, oh, okay, we can just divide 21.625 by 0.125 and that will give us the number of 0.125, which is one eighth to make up the value that we want. But that's not gonna be, it's kind of like you're giving change to a customer using only pennies, okay? That's not the best way to do it. 
So we look at this, and I'm hoping intuitively you guys can go like, I don't think we need a 32, okay? But we need a we need a, a 16. Um, looks like you know, after the 16, it's gone. We don't need an eight, but we're gonna need a four after that, okay? So we need a four, and then after that, we don't need a two, but we need a one, okay? And then after that, we have 0.625 left, but the approach doesn't change, okay? So we look at 0.625 and ask, do we have a 0.5 in 0.625? Yes. Okay. So we have a 0.5. And then after that, we have 0.125 left, which means we don't have a quarter anymore, but we do have one of one eighth after that. Okay. So when we look at this, we look at each one as a base two number. 16 as a base two number, what does it look like? The quantity known to us as 16, which is 2 to the power of 4. What does it look like as a binary number? 4, 0, 2, 0. 1 followed by how many zeros? 4, zero. 4, zero. Very good. So 1 followed by 4 zeros in base 2 is what we know in base 16, I mean, excuse me, and in base 10 as 16. So we have 1 followed by 4 zeros, you know, is, this is in, okay. So I'm emphasizing this is in base 2, in parent 2. So what else do we need? Uh, looks like we need a four, okay? So four is a one, zero, zero in base two. And then we need a one, which is you know, just one in base two. And then what do we need? Well, what about the point five? It is two to the power of negative one. So in base two, how do we express it? Point one. It is point one, very good, okay? So let me explain why it is point one. Okay, so that is, okay, this is the correct place. The reason why it is point 0.1 is we call this digit zero. What do we call this in, in terms of digit position? Digit negative one. So digit negative one is corresponding to whatever base raised to the power of negative one. So that's why in base two, point 0.1 is representing one half. I'm gonna pause and make sure that this concept is understood. In other words, what we see on the other side, okay, on the positive side of digits, digit zero, digit one, digit two, digit three, digit four, and each digit is representing the presence or the absence of a power of two corresponding to that position, it works on the other side of the point as well. So this is basically saying we have one of two to the power of negative one, because that one where the cursor is you know, over, that is digit negative one or position negative one. Is that okay? The entire purpose of the point, okay, this point here is to tell us where digit zero is and also where digit negative one is. That's the entire purpose of that point. Because without that point, we can look at the number, it's like I have no idea where digit zero is. Now we do. All right, so we have one more thing, okay? We have a you know, one eighth, and one eighth is known as two to the power of negative three. Negative three. So we have to find digit negative three. So we go like, this is uh, digit negative one, digit negative two, this is digit negative three. So when we add up all these, okay, you don't even have to know how to do base two addition because you can see that along every column, there's up to one, one only. So there's no chance of a carry. So with no carry, it's pretty easy. So we, it becomes one, zero, one, zero, one, point, one, zero, one. Okay, it just kind of works out that way. So the final answer is this is one, zero, one, zero, one, point, one, zero, one in base two. So what we know in base 10 as 21.625 is known as 10101.101 in base two. Are we doing okay so far with this? So this explains the point of a floating point number, but it doesn't quite explain the floating part. Okay, so I'm gonna explain the floating part using a base 10 example, and then we're gonna go back to this one and then use the base two version. So we'll, we'll switch gear and talk about base 10 notation. So let me move this up. Okay, so it's out of the screen. That's all I wanted to do. Now we want to talk about the speed of light.
Okay, what is the speed of light in meters per second? I cannot remember. <laughs> we'll just look it up. Okay, so we say, what is the speed of light? That's a pretty big number, and I'm going to copy that over here. Okay, so it's two nine nine seven nine two four five eight. Okay, I'm pretty sure it's an irrational number, but we'll just take that. Okay, this is all in base 10. So in your physics class, okay, you might encounter, you know, a few you know, problems, you know, that when you have to use the speed of light as one of the constants. And for the most part, we look at this number and go like, uh, can we just call this 300 million? Sure. Okay. For most practical purposes, you know, three mil, 300 million meters per second is fine okay for most of the physics problems so the next question is okay so this is approximately 300 million one two three four five six okay so when you're working on your homework assignment in physics and you have to actually use this as a constant to calculate stuff do you want to type the speed of light as three zero uh, three three followed by three three every single time what are the chances that you might miss one of the zeros? Pretty high. That's pretty high for me. Okay, I don't know about you, but it's pretty high for me that I'm missing one of the zeros. So what do you do instead on the calculator? How do you enter 300 million? Three times 10 to the power of eight. But how do you type it in with your calculator? Now that is dependent on the calculator, but most of the time we have something that looks like this. Oops, not 10, it's eight. Okay, so three E eight is the C notation. Okay, this is actually C notation to represent three times 10 to the power of eight. So whatever is after the, or on the right hand side of the little E is specifying the power of 10 as an exponent. And then whatever is to the left-hand side of the E is what, what I would call a coefficient. It is just a number that is going to be multiplied by 10 to the power of whatever the value is on the right-hand side of the E. Is that okay? This is called what notation? This is called the scientific notation. So, okay. So the question now is what does that have anything to do with a floating point number in base two. Well, okay. So let me just kind of give you the implicit point here. The implicit point is right here. Okay, do you guys all agree that there's a point over there? It's just that if we don't have any decimal places, it's not needed. Now, just because it's not needed doesn't mean that it's not there. It is just always there. It's just that we don't need it to be there. Okay, so instead of going all the way here, and I'm going like, hmm, I would like to get to three times 10 to the power of something. So I can always say that this is this times 10 to the power of zero. Do we have any disagreement that this is one other way to look at this entire expression? It preserved the value, and apparently for no particular reason, we just made it more complicated. But is that okay? Okay, because 10 to the power of zero is one, and if you multiply anything by one, you're not really changing anything, because one is known as the identity of multiplication. Okay, um, I want to introduce these concepts, even though most of you will never have to know what is the identity of multiplication. Some of you will see it. Okay, you know, it is a very useful concept in abstract algebra, which is. A lot of people think of it as a very difficult branch of math, but it really is not. Okay, it's really useful. Okay, so what I would, I want, yeah, go ahead. Can you do a quick final question? Yeah. What do you think will be the numbers in A minus that will have to do with like adding, modifying, and stuff like that? Probably not much, you know, because your know, floating point or double in this case, you know, uh, by the way, uh, the name double, the full name, is IEEE double precision floating point number. And IEEE stands for international, I cannot remember. <laughs> so it stands for 
I used to be a member, you know, but you know, I don't want to pay the membership fee at one point in time. Uh, on the right side. There we go. The Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Okay, there we go. Thank you. So that's IEEE. So the full name of double that you know in C and C++ is in Institution of Electrical and Electronics Engineers Double Precision Floating Point Method. That's what double actually represents. Okay, so we'll get to this in just a little bit, okay? Um, but to answer your question, I don't think it really is used a lot in hacking per se, okay? Because you know, it's a it's a really awkward way to use you know, bit patterns to represent a value, but we're gonna get into it. Um, but it doesn't really lend itself to hacking um, because you know, the, the width of a double is fixed, which means you know you cannot cause easily cause your know, buffer overflow and other type of you know technique for hacking. Oh, okay, I can see. Okay, so what you're talking about is. So, so, so what you are talking about is understanding how the metadata of your video game is represented on the file, so that when it comes to like your what is your hit point or what is your armor. You can you you can basically easily change that number or the value that you want. So now you can have infinite armor, you know, easily by hacking the meta file or the, the metadata file, so that you can grant yourself your know, infinite armor and your know, super duper you know hit points and weapons and so on. Okay, so it, from that perspective, it is it's hacking in a way you know, by changing the uh, file content. But it's not hacking in the sense of you're trying to get into something, you know. So when you mention hacking, I'm thinking about, you know, get intrusion, you know, which is getting into a system where you're not supposed to get into. But in this case, you're basically changing the data corresponding to certain aspects of the you know, in-game character that you're talking about. Would that make it more modifying than hacking? Hmm? Would that make it more modifying than hacking? It's still hacking because you're still doing something that <laughs> that is... Uh, not supposed to. <laughs> so it's still hacking in a sense, but it's hacking by, you know, with the objective of only changing a few parameters. Yeah. But not gaining um, access when you're not supposed to. So it's a, it's a different kind of hacking. All right, so does that answer your question? Okay, it is kind of related, I would say, you know, because understanding the double representation gives you the ability to understand what is in the file that stores the metadata for a game. So you can potentially identify which eight bytes, okay, is corresponding to, you know, your health or your armor or your hit point and stuff like that. And then if you modify that when you load the game, unless the game does a sanity check somewhere, okay, it would just go like, oh, okay, now you have, you know, like, you know, 200 times you know, what you're supposed to have. <laughs> Oh yeah, games have evolved a lot, okay? So I'm gonna change this a little bit here, okay? So we'll start with this. Okay, so if I want to move the point, okay, to the left by one, but I want the value to be preserved, what do I need to do to the power of 10? It'll be one, right? Because you know, if you look at the, this is called the coefficient, this is called the exponent of 10. So if the coefficient is only one tenth of what it used to be, in order for the entire product to store, to represent the same value, I kind of need to increase the power of 10 by one to compensate for the coefficient being one tenth of what it used to be. Is that okay? Okay. So I can repeat this operation you know, many times until you guys go like, Okay, we get it. Oh, we get it. Okay, can we move on? So we'll go ahead and do it just, you know, like maybe twice more and then we'll go to the final solution. So that this means I'm going to move this point to over here. And what should I do with this power of 10? Two. Okay, okay. So you guys are getting the, the idea. Okay, I'm going to move this again. And this time to here. <laughs> and what should I do over here? 
three. Okay, very good. So I'm just going to say dot 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 until we get three point bunch of zeros. Okay, times ten to the power of what? Hmm? Eight. Eight is correct. Okay. Because that is exactly the number of times we have moved the the point. Because we moved it from here. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So every time we move the point to the left, we have to increase the power of ten by one, because you know every time we move the digit, we are um, we end up dividing the coefficient by ten. So somebody else has to compensate for the division by ten, and the multiplication by ten, which is the counter, is by changing or incrementing the exponent of ten. Are we good with that? Okay, excellent. So now the question is, and by the way, this is what we call a um, scientific notation that is normalized. So a normalized scientific notation always has the coefficient between zero and just less than the base that we're dealing with. Since this is in base ten, so that means we need this portion to be just less than ten. Okay. Well, I shouldn't say just less than ten, but it cannot be ten. Okay. We have to exclude ten. But it has to be at least zero. Ah, I think three meets that criteria. And then this side is just the exponent. Okay. And in this particular case, when the <coughs> when the coefficient is between zero and the base, it has a different name. You can also call this the mantissa. M A N T I S S A. The mantissa. So the mantissa is a special case of the coefficient where the when the coefficient is between zero and the base. Is that okay? All right. So now we go back to the previous example in base two, and then we ask the same question. Okay. So now we say, okay, can we say this is you know this blah 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 times two to the power of zero? Would that change anything? That's not going to change anything because any number to the power of zero is one. Okay. Which means uh, we're not doing anything to the to the value to the original value. So now let me give you this here, one zero one zero point one one zero one in base two. So what do you think we should do here? Hmm? We change it to a one. We change it to a one because every time you move the point to the left, we are dividing the number by the base, and this is in base two, right? So moving the point from here to here. Is dividing this coefficient by two. Now let me let me do this first, okay? And then we go back and say, check. I'm not a hundred percent sure that this is one half of what it used to be. So how do we, what do we deal with that? What do we do? What do you think? We we have enough tools to go like, okay, check. Let me try to independently verify what you just said. That the coefficient is now one half of what it used to be. How do we do that? Well, you do it by just looking at the you know the digits. So we look at this case. Okay, I'm going to erase this part later on. Okay, so I will use a mouse pointer. This is an eight. Okay, so we have eight plus two plus one half plus a quarter. We don't have an eight anymore, but this time we have one sixteen. So when you look at this number, it is okay. So. Maybe fractions are easier to look at in this case. So we have a half, and then we have a quarter. So we have ten and what? So that would be eight four one thirteen divided by sixteen, I think. Okay, you guys can check my math because you know one half is two divided by sixteen. One quarter is four divided by sixteen. One one over sixteen is just one over sixteen. So we have eight. Plus four plus one it should add up to thirteen or if my math adds up. Okay. My math is good? Okay. So is this one half of what the previous line has? Okay, so let's take a look at this one as a mixed fraction. So this one has one eight plus no four plus one two oh I take it back. It has a sixteen, sorry. It has a sixteen plus a four plus a one. And then we have five over eight, I think. Let me double check. 
So we have a half, okay, so we have one half and one eighth. All right, so as a mixed fraction, what does it look like? It is 21 and 5 eighths. So, but you know, it's easier to look at it as 16, so it has 10 16, okay? Okay, so the question now is, is 21 and 10 over 16, um, is one half of that 10 and 13 divided by 16? I think it does not equal. Okay, so that means no, it, it does. Okay. Okay. Oh, I forgot that you know there's the one over here, which is another 16. So when you add the 16 to the 10, you have 26. 26 divided by 2 is 13. So it does work out. All right. Okay. So this is where we can independently verify that. Oh, every time we move the point. From here to here, we are dividing that number or the value being represented by 2, which is the base of the binary number. Is that okay? All right. So I want to kind of introduce these methods because you know this is how you can practice stuff without even me giving you additional work because you are generating this work by yourself, which is helpful not only in terms of verifying what I'm saying, but also exercising you know, the base conversion thing and exercising your understanding of how numbers represent values. So this is all kind of important. I want you guys to develop the skills to look at the material and think about, okay, how am I gonna double check this? Do I have the tools to do it? Because every time you think about that, you are basically going through your inventory of what tools do I have right now? And every time you go through that inventory, you are strengthening your understanding of the concept and also you're reminding yourself, okay, we got all of these concepts already introduced. The question is, can I use these concepts you know, for the purpose of double checking and verifying? Yes? Because 2 is the base. In other words, the division has to do with the base. So if you're doing base 2, it's division by 2. If you're doing base 7, it's division by 7, and so on. And the reason is really, there are two ways to look at this. We just verify this example, right? But the reason is, you know, we are basically shifting what power of 2 is corresponding to each and every single digit. This used to be specifying 2 to the power of 1, now it specifies 2 to the power of 0 because it's right next to the top. So that's another way to look at why it is dividing the value by the base. It's because the exponent of what each digit is representing is reduced by 1 because we, we move the point. Mm -hmm. So you can probably guess what I'm going to do next. Okay, so we are going to, uh, let's see, this one. And what about here? Right, what, what do we put here? Two, right? Okay. So, you know, if I just skip all the way to uh, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one. Oops, I think I missed something. There we go. And what do you think the power of two is here? We shifted the point, what, how many times? Four times, okay? So we move the point four times because it was originally here. One, two, three, four. And every time we move the point, we have to multiply by two, which is represented by incrementing the power of two. So this is the eventual representation. And if you don't believe me, you can actually work this out. I mean, this is a little bit of a nasty case because you have um, no half. This is uh, one divided by four. This is by 8, by 16, by 32, 64, and 128, okay? So, you know, it's, it's messy as a fraction, but it, we are not changing the value being represented because we are compensating with changing the exponent of 2. 
Are we doing okay so far with this particular example? Do you guys see the point floating across the screen? Now, if you say I don't, I can understand because you know, I don't have an animation. But if you think about each one of these four lines as a frame in an anime, you know, in an animation, and you play these four rows you know, like you know, in sequence, you will see the point floating to the left hand side. That is why it is called a floating point. Okay? Because we are floating the point using the exponent of two to let us do it. So just like the other case, okay, this one here is really just a coefficient because it doesn't meet the requirement of a mantissa. This one here is also just a coefficient because it also does not meet the criterion of being a mantissa. Eh, same here, okay? But when we get to this point, it is a mantissa. It is a coefficient, but it is also a mantissa because whatever this value is, okay, so let, let me get this part. Are you convinced that this value is greater than or equal to one? It's one point something, even though it's in phase two, one point something is always greater than or equal to one. But are you also convinced that this value is less than two, which is the base? Yeah, because in base two, what is two in base two? One zero, okay, one zero. And this is definitely less than one zero, so it's less than two. So now it is also the mantissa of this format. Is that okay? In other words, floating point numbers in from the theoretical perspective is no more than scientific notation, but in base two. Are we doing okay so far with that concept? Okay, floating point numbers in theory is just scientific notation, but everything is in base two. We good? So far? Okay, all right. So now we're gonna get into the actual module, okay? And we'll go to this module and talk about um, the IEEE uh, double precision floating point number. And because somebody from Wikipedia already made a pretty nice diagram, I just decided that, you know, I don't have to do the same thing. All right? So you look at this whole thing, you go like, ah. Oh. What is that, okay? So it is already color-coded, okay? The pink portion is what we call the fraction of the mantissa. So, okay, it's, it's just a name, okay? We'll, we'll just say that it is the fraction of the mantissa. The green portion is not really the exponent, it is called the biased exponent, okay? And then we have a sign, which is a single bit over here. So the, the numbers underneath this representation they identify the important bit positions. So we have bit zero all the way here. By the time we get to the green portion, it is bit 52. By the time we get to the side bit, it is bit 63. Okay, so how wide, how many bits do we need for one double? 64 bits, very good, because we count from zero. So because it has bit 63, that means we have 64 bits or eight bytes. Because one byte is, how many bits? Eight bits. What about a nibble? I'm not kidding you. There's, one bit? Hmm? Isn't that just one bit? Nope. One bit is one binary one digit, and then one byte is eight bits. What is a nibble? Four bits, that is correct, okay? So the early computer scientists had fun with the terms. So a bit is a very small byte, right? So it's one binary digit. A nibble is a bigger byte, so it is four bits. And then a byte is a byte, you know, which is uh, eight bits. But they kind of stopped there. So 16 bits does not have a, it's not a chunk. <laughs> All right. So. Now we look at all of these bits and go like, uh, what do we use these bits for? Well, it has, IEEE, I mean, uh, Wikipedia has two ways to represent this. So this is one way to do it, okay? We are taking negative one to the power of the sign. Well, guess what? The sign can only be a zero or a one. If the sign is a zero, negative, to the power, negative one to the power of zero is, 
is 1, okay? Anything to the power of 0 is 1, including negative 1, okay? So negative 1 to the power of 0 is 1. What about um, negative 1 to the power of 1? Because the sine bit can be a 1, 2. So negative 1 to the power of 1 is negative 1. So this is just multiplying either a 1 or a negative 1 to the rest, okay? So now what is the rest, okay? This is one way to look at it. This is the other way to look at it, okay? So let's look at the first one first. So note this little subscript of 2 here. What is that representing? Is it base 2? Very good. So we have one point, okay? So that means this one is digit 0. So that means uh, P51 is digit negative 1, B50 is digit negative 2, and B49 is digit negative 3, and so on. Um, and then we multiply that by 2 to the power of E. E, by the way, is the unsigned interpretation of the green part, minus 1,023. So you might ask, why 1,023? Because IEEE says so. Okay, that's pretty much the answer. It's because IEEE says so. Okay, so that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at this is to look at each individual bit and see how they contribute to the value of the entire thing. So instead of looking at B51 as digit negative one, we use the sigma notation, which is really the same thing, because we, we are looking at B52 minus I. So when we want to look at 51, it would, I would be one, right? But we are also raising the power of this to 2 to the power of negative 1. So it boils down to, oh, OK, so B51 is treated as digit negative 1 in base 2. And the rest it kind of follows, too. So this is just an alternative way to look at this. Are we doing OK so far? OK. And E is, OK, let me see if they actually talk about how E is computed. So E is basically looking at these 11 bits in green and only use the unsigned interpretation of those 11 bits. And you have to remember to subtract 1,023 before it becomes the actual exponent of 2. All right. So do we have any questions about what we see on the projector at this point? We good here? All right. So what we're gonna do next is to convert um, the value in our example into this particular format. Okay, so we are looking at this here. So now we're gonna expand this a little bit. So let me use this to cover more portions of the screen. All right, so let's look at this. So according to this, um, what is our E? In other words, what Minus 1,023 is 4. So E is 4 plus 1,023, which is 1,027. Okay, 1,027. Because the green portion here is an unsigned number, where if you subtract 1,023 from it, you will get the actual exponent of, four, of 2. Okay, and because we want the actual exponent of 2 to be 4, so that means we have to add 1,023 to 4 in order to know what kind of unsigned value we want to represent with the green portion. And by the way, there are 11 bits here, okay? All right, so what is 1,027 in binary? If I have 11 bits to represent 1,027, what is that going to look like? So we look at powers of 2 again, right? So I think there's 1. And after the 1, we have a 2, and then we have 1,024. 1,024 is 2 to the power of 10. Is that okay? So all of these are powers of 2, and then we look at this and go like, okay, so what is 1,024? It's 1 followed by 10 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And what is 2? It is 1, 0 in base 2. And 1 is always just 1, also in base 2. So when you add up all of these, we have 1 followed by 8 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. With 1, 1 at the end. OK, I'm going to pause to make sure that we are OK with this conversion. We good here? 
So if you're not convinced, okay, how do you make sure that this conversion process is correct? You do it the opposite, okay? You ignore the rest, okay? And then you look at this number here, and you ask, how many ones do we have? We got one. How many twos do we have? One. How many four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512 do we have? None of those. The next one up is 1,024. We have one of 1,024. So you do the reverse, and then you add 1,024 plus two plus one, and it should add up back to 1,027. So that's how we can do the verification by con phase conversion. Okay, so doing this is useful, you know, once again, for two purposes. One is you're double checking that Tech did not mess up his math. That's one. Two, you just practice base conversion in both directions, okay? Because you're practicing base conversion in this direction to get to the phase two representation, you go like, okay, but I need to convert it back to make sure that it is representing 1,027, so that's the other way of phase conversion, okay? Cool, and how many bits do we have here? We have exactly 11 bits already, okay? So that means these 11 bits will go to where the green stuff is. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So now we try to work with you know, the other stuff. Okay, so let's go take a look at the sign. Okay, the sign is the easy one. What is the sign bit? Okay. It can only be a zero or one. And the value that we want to represent is non-negative. So that means the sign has to be a zero. Okay, that's an easy one. So that means the blue thing here is a zero. The trickiest part is the pink part. Okay, because the pink part is not the entire mantissa, but only the fraction of the mantissa. In other words, only these digits are going into the pink part. The one point is not represented anywhere within the 64 bit numbers. So you ask, but why? Isn't that important too? Well, it is important, but that one is always being tried anyway. If you think about the, a mantissa in base two, okay, I misspoke a little bit earlier, okay? The mantissa has to be greater than or equal to one, but less than the base. I said earlier that it has to be greater than or equal to zero, that was erroneous, okay? So it has to be greater than or equal to one, but less than two. If we do this process, the mantissa is always going to be greater than or equal to one, but less than two. So that one is, is always going to be there. The one point is always going to be there. Why do you want to waste one bit in the 64 bit to represent something that is always going to be there? Okay. But then I lied. <laughs> because somebody's still going to go like, wait, hold on a second here. If that one is always going to be there, then there's no way to represent the actual value of zero. And you would have been correct, okay? So zero is a very special case. If all the bits, if all 64 bits are zeros, IEEE says, uh, just think of it as the actual zero. Even though using the conversion process, it is not exactly zero. It would, be, it would have been the smallest value that can be represented, but not exactly zero. But IEEE says, uh, just look at it as zero. Treat it as a zero. Okay, so there are special cases in the representation where when you look at the bit pattern, it represents one thing, but the actual meaning is something else, okay? So that's one of them. There are a few, actually. Um, all right, so now we have to figure out the pink part. The pink part, which is the fractional part, okay? Fractional part is really just excluding the one point. So now we have zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, which let me kind of tell you which part it is, it's this part, okay? So this part goes here, okay, at the left-hand side of the pink portion, and then you go like, but that's not enough bits to fill in the entire 52 bits, okay? Because what we have here is what, seven? So seven is not 52, what are we gonna do? Just pad a bunch of zeros <laughs> until it fills up 52 bits, okay? So now, Okay, let's put everything together, okay? Exactly what is the bit pattern 
to represent the value of what we had earlier, which is what? 21.625 in decimal. So now we have um, a zero for the sine bit. And then for the exponent, we have this pattern here. So I'm just going to copy and paste because every time I type, there's a chance that I <clears throat> might you know, type incorrectly. So paste here. And then the rest, which is the fractional part of the mantissa, is going to go here. All right. Okay. So I claim, I claim that this bit pattern is representing the value of 21.625 in base 10. What are you guys going to do? You want to verify it, right? So how do we verify something like this? Okay. Well, first of all, there's a lot of zeros and ones. Okay. So we would love to have a way to go like, okay, is there a better way to specify this number, which is 64 bit wide, but without the use of 64 individual zeros and ones? Well, the answer is, yeah, there are ways to do it. Let's use base 16, okay? Um, so I'm gonna use the following to kind of show you what base 16 is. So we have you know, bit pattern or binary on one side, hexadecimal in the other side, on the other side. Hex stands for hexa, which is six. Deci, which is 10. So hexadeci means 16, okay? So you go like base 16, who's gonna use base 16? Computer people? You are either are right now already, or you will be, okay? So we now look at bit patterns, okay? Zero, 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 zero. That's known as zero in base 16. Is that surprising to you? I hope not. Okay, we got zero, 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 one. That's known as one. Zero, zero, one, two. Uh, what do you think that is? Okay. Uh-huh. There we go. So we are just incrementing, okay? So everything is nice and easy. Okay. So that's six, seven, okay. That's seven. Let's go. There we go. This is eight. That's nine. And that is, oh, wait. <laughs> it has to be a single digit, right? Okay, you go like, we don't have a single digit for 10, okay? Well, not in base 10, but we have the alphabet. In, we have the English alphabet to borrow stuff from. So we just go like, ah, why don't we just call this lowercase or uppercase A? Is that okay? And then the next one is B, which is what we know as 11, okay? So the quantity of 11 is represented by the digit E in base 16. Is that concept okay? Is it okay? Yep, okay. So the rest, I think you know already, okay? 1100 one, zero, zero is 12, which is known as C, and then we have 1101, zero, one, one, which is 13, it is known as D. 1110 one, one, is E. 1111 one, one, one is known as F. So this is a base conversion table between base 2 and base 16. You can see that it does not involve division, it does not involve multiplication, it does not involve mod, it is just floating up, okay? You can go in either direction. If you see the hexadecimal, if you see a number in hexadecimal and you want to convert it to binary, you just go in the left-hand direction, okay? If you are given a long string of zeros and ones, which is what we have here, and you want to convert it into base 16, which is a much, much, much more concise way to represent the same thing, you go in the right-hand side direction. So this might be a table you want to kind of keep on your notes until you are so familiar with it that you don't need it anymore, okay? So one more hint, okay, is, yeah, keep this on your notes, okay? Put it on paper so you'll be ready to take it to the exam because we're gonna need it, okay? If you know this by heart already, it's fine, okay? Yeah, because I have learned this you know, like for a long time. Have you guys seen hexadecimal numbers in your life? Yes. And 
how many of you have a smartphone? I don't really need it. So. <laughs> I think the, the more interesting question is how many do you have more than one cell phone? Because you might be working and your workplace goes like, okay, use this phone for work, okay? Because when we need to reach you be, and you're on call, this is going to be the phone that rings, okay? So when you go to your phone, okay, um, does anyone know what is your um, MAC address, M-A-C, MAC address? Not by heart. Hmm? Not by heart. But do you know what it is? You know, not, not so much what the numbers are, but do you know what, is, what it is, what is useful? The MAC address is uniquely identifying a network card, okay, a NIC, N-I-C, network interface card. So on your phone, you can go to, oh, I cannot even remember how to get there. It's probably somewhere along about phone. And you go to. So you need some status information. Status, okay. Yeah, they move that around depending on, you know, because I have a Samsung phone, and some, some Samsung just wants to move things around a little bit, so it's not standard Android anymore. But anyway, the MAC address on any type of network card is usually expressed in hexadecimal. And how many digits are in that hexadecimal number? Twelve digits. Okay, that may be the case. I cannot remember. So there are six. There are six bytes. Okay, yeah, six bytes, and each byte has two digits. So you're correct. So it's twelve digits. So if we are to express the MAC address in binary instead, how long is it going to be? Twelve times four, forty-eight. So when, let's say you're calling at and okay, because of a network issue and they ask you what is your MAC address, do you want to spell out 48 zeros and ones, or would you rather just spell out, you know, uh, 12, you know, zero to nine and then, you know, A to F? Hexadecimal is probably the better case, right? The better your version. Okay, so this is hexadecimal. So what we're going to do here is to try to convert this number, you know, which you can barely see on the, on the screen, into hexadecimal, okay? So we'll take a look at how that works, okay? So I'm going to rewrite this number, okay? I can do copy and paste like here. But this time, I'm removing all the spaces that were originally there because when you want to convert from base 2 to base 16, you want to chop the number into blocks of 4, okay? So every 4 bits becomes one block because it is one hexadecimal digit. And the rest is pretty easy. It's just a bunch of zeros. We just have to figure out how many zeros we have. Okay, so looking up the table, okay? Now the table is on the, on the projector. What is zero, one, zero, zero in hexadecimal? Okay, that's a four. What about this one? Zero, this one? Three. And this one? A, that's correct, okay, and then a bunch of zeros. So now the question is, how many zeros do we have? Well, you can just always go like, okay, how many digits have we already specified here? So five digits, so how many more digits do we need as the zeros? 11. 11, very good, because five hexadecimal digits account for 20 bits already, because it's five times four. So the entire thing has 64, which means we're looking at 64 minus 20, which is 44 bits left over for zeros, okay? 44 bits of zeros, because we're dividing 44 bits in blocks of four, so how many blocks do we have in terms of 44 bits? 11, because 44 divided by four is 11, so that's why we know that there are 11 zeros here, so with this is one, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, so if I were to look at the actual hexadecimal representation, it's a, the zero X is a prefix. So in C and C++, the compiler would say, if you precede a number with zero X, then the rest is interpreted as in hexadecimal. That's why I put a zero X here to emphasize that this is a hexadecimal number. Okay. Well, but Pat, you did not, you, you're just, you know, kind of walking away and, you know, pushing around the, beating around the bush, you're not answering the question. How do we know that this gibberish is really representing 21.625, okay? 
Well, we're getting there. We're getting there. So the way to do that is I'm going to write a, a complicated program to do this. Okay, this is as complicated as it gets for this class. So we go to the temp folder, and then I'm going to write a program. Okay, let me put up here so everybody, including people in the back, can see it. Um, we'll go, you know, I'll just call it flow.c. Okay, there we go. Um, I'm going to pound include stdint.h. Most of you probably have not seen this pedophile. It stands for standard integer file. It gives us the ability to specify, you know, integers of exact widths. In other words, in your C and C++ class, okay, I'll give you a question. Um, how wide is an int? If you just say int x, how many bits is in that variable? 64, how come you, it's not 32? How, how can you be sure it's not 32? Or 16? So on Arduino, an int is actually only 16 bit wide. If you have an older operating system that's only 32 bit wide, then int is really only 32 bit wide. It is 64 bit wide on most modern architecture because the processor itself has a natural path of, six, of 64 bit wide. Okay? But in the future, it is entirely possible that it's going to be 128 bit. So that means you know, when you use the word int, or when you say short int, or when you say long int, you really have no idea how wide that integer is, which is okay in your other classes, but not okay in this class, because we need to know exactly how many bits we're dealing with. So that's why you know, this pedophile is useful. Okay, I'm going to show you why it is useful. So we'll have the usual template int you know, main return to zero. And in here, we have u int 8. Uh, 64 underscore t. So typically, this is not a built-in type. Okay, this type is defined in standard integer .h, but that's exactly what that header file is useful for. Is if you know exactly the width of the integer that you need, you can spell that out. And in this case, if I say this is my int x, then x is exactly a 64-bit unsigned integer. Okay. And this works across all the platforms. If I were to write this, uh, write, write this program on an Arduino platform, it would have been 64 bit wide. If I were to do this on a 32 bit platform, int x would also be 64 bit wide. Okay? So this is a way to make sure that the width of the integer is as you specify. Um, so, other than this class, why is this useful? Why do you think this is useful? It has to do with the range. Okay. Storage-wise, okay, very good. Okay, so one aspect is you know, how many bytes is going to be used up by the integer, but there's another important implication. It has to do with the range of values that x can represent. Okay, because you know if you use an integer that somehow is shorter or narrower than it should be, then there might be values that you need to represent that cannot be represented by that integer. Okay? I have run into those problems in robotics where you know I can run the simulator in a, a, a platform like on a platform like this, everything works fine. Okay, the motion control stuff all works fine. But the moment I port the program to run on a smaller platform, it run up to a certain point and then it just go, okay? And it has to do with the range of values that need to be represented is exceeding the range of a regular int or unsigned can represent. So that's why, you know, this is important, okay? To make sure that your program can work across platforms, this is always a good thing to do, okay? So here we have x equal to zero, and this is the entire program. You go like, <coughs> Heck, this program did not even say anything about the value that we just figured out. So what is the whole point of figuring out this thing here? So I will show you, okay, all in time, okay, all in good time. So we'll, okay, save the program, and then we'll de uh, run it, okay? So gcc dash g dash, um, let's see, dash o, 
flow, flow.c. This is how I run the, uh, the C compiler on the command line. And now I'm going to introduce something that you should have been using all along, but probably have not been using it. Okay, it's called a debugger. How many people have used the uh, a debugger in your previous class? So I cannot say that I'm shocked, but I'm also puzzled, okay? Because you know the question is, so how did you debug your program in your previous classes? <laughs> uh, most people say C out, okay? You know, because you just have you just splatter your program with C outs until you 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 visualize everything. It's like, oh, okay, this is where it goes wrong, right? You know, it works for smaller programs, but for larger programs where the flow of the logic is complicated and you have a lot of loops inside another loop, inside another loop, the output is like like this, right? It's trying to spot where it went wrong is difficult, okay? So the use of a debugger is super useful, and we're going to use the debugger for multiple purposes in this class, okay? All right. So the way you use a debugger is you can list the program. This is a really easy program. And then you use a breakpoint, and I'm going to put a breakpoint on line 7, okay? So a breakpoint means, you know, at line 7, the program will pause its execution. It, it's not the same thing as stopping. Stopping means you have no chance of continuing the program execution. Pausing means you can unpause it and continue execution. In this case, it really doesn't matter, okay? So I just put a breakpoint here, and it will just say that breakpoint 1, you know, the next one's going to be 2, 3, 4, and so on is at this particular address on the file with flow.c line 7, okay? And then I'll run the program, okay? R is run, okay? You can also type the entire name run, but R is going to be fine. And by the way, if you are thinking, oh, does that mean we have to learn all the command line stuff of using GDB in this class? The answer is no, okay? Um, if you use code blocks or VS Code or uh, online GDB, they all come with a GUI way of setting breakpoints. Typically by clicking uh, the space to the left of a line number. Okay, so that's typically how you set up a breakpoint in those you know, GUIs or graphical user interface or IDEs, integrated development environment. Okay, so you know, this is just my way of doing things. Okay, so now it stops execution. You just go like, what does this have anything to do with what we just worked on? Okay, just be patient. So in a debugger, you always have a way to change the value of a variable from inside the debugger, okay? So this is helpful in two ways, because one is if you spot that the program is wrong, okay, your variable has the wrong value, you can actually inject the correct value into the variable and let it continue to execute, just so that you can see, okay, let's say I fix this bug and this value is now correct, how far is it going to go okay, before it breaks again? So there, are, you know, it's, it's valuable. And then I switch back to my uh, mouse pad, and I'm just going to copy this and then paste it over here. There we go. Okay. So press the Enter key, and you guys go like, okay, so we must be done by now. Okay. So that means you know, we can now say, okay, let's find out what is in X. You go like, Wait, hold on a second here. This is yet another value, it looks like, right? Because we were expecting to see 21.625. We put in this bit pattern over here in hexadecimal, and it gave us a third number. It's like, what does this third number have to do with anything? This is the base 10 representation of this hexadecimal value. In other words, the same 64 bits that we just figured out that should represent 21.625, but if you look at those 64 bits as an unsigned integer, this is what it is representing. I'm gonna pause here to see if there are any questions about what I just said. Remember, a bunch of zeros and ones have no intrinsic meaning. It's just a bunch of zeros and ones in a particular order, okay? this is looking at the zeros and ones that we had earlier over here and say, I'm going to look at this as an unsigned number. Okay, in this class, it means we're using the vView function 
on this bit pattern and interpreting all 64 bits. If you did that with the sigma notation, then you would have come up with exactly the same value here. Is that okay? So this has nothing to do with float. Yep. So if you're talking about the regular computer where there's a limited number of locations to store something, then you cannot represent the character. Infinity is more of a concept than a value. So that means you know, most of the time you cannot use, you, you cannot find the actual representation of infinity. There's no representation. All right, so the next thing is, oh, I remember there's a typecasting thing, right? You know, I can typecast you know, into a double, okay? The same thing that we have here. <clears throat> and that should come up as, you know, 41.625. The answer is no, okay? It's not going to work. The reason why it is not going to work is the way the compiler sees this typecasted expression is the first thing it sees is x. And it will say, okay, what is the value of x? It's going to give you back this value here. And then it will convert this value into a double representation. So that's why it's not going to work. What it will give you is the scientific notation of exactly the same thing. Well, not exactly the same thing. Because with um, a double, you can see the last few digits here are not the same. Because we, the precision is not there anymore. With a 64-bit unsigned integer, you have all 64 bits to specify the actual value that you want to represent. But in a double, you only have 52 bits to do it. Because the 11 bits, 11 bits were used to specify the exponent, so it's not used to specify the precision. So you lose precision in order to extend the range of values that you can represent. So that's why you know, a double is not always the best way to represent a value. Sometimes an int or a 64-bit int is actually better for the job. Okay, so this is not working. So I'm going to do something else. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a few questions. This is a good review of the concepts that you have learned in C and C++. What is this? The address of x. Okay, so the address of x has a type of... It's a un64 underscore t asterisk, right? So if, if I press the enter key, this is what it is. Okay, this is the actual type, un64 underscore t with an asterisk here, which means whatever follows, okay, this gibberish here is of the type that it is a pointer or address of a 64-bit unsigned integer. Okay, so this is a very, very quick review of some key concepts that we need in this class. Not only now, but also a little bit later. Okay, what about this? What am I doing with the, uh, the last line on the inner debug? Okay, so okay, let's, let's hear how we can read this. We start with x, okay? And then instead of just saying x, I'm saying, okay, let's look at a, the address of x. The address of x has a type of, it is the address of a 64-bit unsigned integer. Okay, that's kind of natural. But I'm applying the type cast operator to the address of the 64-bit unsigned integer. In other words, I'm telling the compiler, or the debugger in this case, and go like, okay, I know what I'm doing. 
even though this was the address of a 64-bit unsigned integer, I want you to look at it as, a, as the address of a double. Is that okay? All right? So if I were to press the Enter key right now, it would give me pretty much the same thing, the same gibberish over here, except the type has changed. So that very same location in memory is no longer considered as the address of a 64-bit unsigned integer, and instead, it is now seen as the address of a double. Are we good so far? So what can you do with the address of a double? Um, I think one of the things we can do is to dereference it, okay? So what is dereferencing? What is this asterisk right here to the left of the 19 person? It's like, tell me what, what is it there, okay? Tell me what is at this location. But at this point, the location is no longer considered the address of a 64-bit unsigned integer. It is now considered to be the address of a double. So the way the very same 64 bits are interpreted is not of an unsigned int anymore. It is now looking at those same 64 bits and go like, oh, because it's a double, this bit is the sign for the entire number, these 11 bits is the biased exponent, and the rest is the fraction of the mantissa. Is that okay? So I'm tricking the compiler, or the debugger in this case, into, oh, let's interpret this in some way that you were not originally, you know, not the original type of X. So now we got our 21.625 back. So this entire exercise, okay, one purpose is to double check our conversion earlier, okay, and go like, oh yeah, we did the right conversion, okay. But the other purpose of this entire presentation was to remind you of things that you should have learned in C and C++. Now, do I expect you guys to come up with this way of verifying the result of our little discussion today? No. But am I expecting you to understand the approach now that I have explained it? The answer is yes, okay? So if you have any gap in your knowledge of taking the address off, which is the ampersand operator, and also dereferencing an address, which is the asterisk, you might need to review those concepts from your CISP 360 class. Or you can go to any other websites, okay? So I would go to any website, okay? Go to Google search or just chat to GPT. Let's try chat to GPT. Let's see how much it knows about this, okay? So I am just gonna type, give me a quick tutorial on a few concepts, okay? So the nice thing about ChatGPT is it actually understands um, Markdown, so I can actually use the bullet point thing. So we want um, typecasting, okay, typecasting. We want to know um, the address of operator, the address of operator, which is ampersand, and also the D reference operator, the reference is spelled correctly, okay, which is the asterisk in C, C++, and include examples in this tutorial, okay. So let's see what comes back. Okay, that's implicit, that's explicit, you know, here's an example. Not bad. Yep. So that's one productive way to make use of chat and GPT because it does give us a fairly good tutorial on exactly what it's talking about. Okay. So try to make use of these you know, resources. I think the free version, you know, even if you don't sign in, you know, it will still kind of give you this. It's just the number of prompts you can make per hour is limited, okay? All right, so that pretty much concludes you know, today's lecture, but I do have you know, one, a few more things to do before the lab because we're gonna need it. 
So today's lab is mostly a math thing, okay? So as much as some of us do not like you know, to use math, computer science is actually a branch of math, okay? So when you get into computer science, it is math. So I'm, I'm making it visible already, and I'll write down the actual um, access code on the whiteboard. It's IEEE. I did not take row today, but you're know, doing that, you kind of take the row too. So this is our access code. This is an I, not a one. All right, but this is important, okay? Because I don't want to answer this question multiple times in this class. So I'm just gonna give you the math that you need. Okay, so this is a quick rundown on math. Y equals to B to the power of X, if and only if the log B of Y equals to X. Okay, so we are basically locking, working with uh, logarithmic math and also exponents. Okay, how many people are comfortable with log and stuff like that? It's on your calculator too? But you have to be careful about what base it's using, okay? The C and C++ notation of E, X, E, Y, where E is uh, verbatim, which means it is not something to be substituted, specifies the value of X times 10 to the power of Y. So that means negative 12.34 E56 is representing negative 12.34 times 10 to the power of 56. Is that okay? All right, in this notation, x is called the coefficient, and y specifies the exponent of 10. If one, if x is, if the absolute value of x is between one and 10, excluding 10 itself, then x is also known as the normalized coefficient, also known as the mantissa, which is what we talked about earlier in class. If you use a calculator, be very careful, because your e can also mean Euler's number to the power of, okay? The natural E, or the, not the natural, but um, E is a constant, okay? So when you use E, it can mean that too. So learn how to use your calculator, because most calculators have a, have a different key to specify times 10 to the power of. If I remember correctly, TIs have the key called what, EEX or EXP? Does anyone have a TI calculator? Okay. So what, what is the key, what is the label on the key for X? Uppercase, right? Yeah, both of us. Yeah, so for TI calculators, the key on the keyboard looks like this. And I think on Casio calculators, it is called EXP. So on different calculators, it's different, but on almost no calculator, it is just E itself, okay? Because when you use the key that says just lowercase e, it is always basically asking e to the power of something, and e is the Euler's constant. This is not what we want, okay? If you use uh, Google search or Google, it's the same thing, okay? Just be very careful how you specify the constants, okay? Um, are there any other questions about the, the math here? Yes. In the context of this particular lab, E is always specifying times 10 to the power of something. So be very careful when you use a calculator because you know, when you use the letter E in a calculator, especially one that is online, you, you just paste the equation in, it would mean it's 12, negative 12.34 times the E constant to the power of 56 and not times 10 to the power of 56. All right, so with that, you guys can go ahead and yeah, give the lab a try. Um, there's definitely some math involved in today's lab. You can try to use um, Mathematica or 
Wolfram Alpha or some of the other resources to help you to help you solve the equations. Just make sure that you fully understand how that works. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let me stop the recorder and then upload the content. <clears throat>